Welcome to another episode of Team Anywhere, where CEOs, leaders, and experts at building teams, companies, organizations, and amazing cultures share how to lead from anywhere in the world. I'm your co-host on the East Coast, Ginny Bianco Mathis. And I'm your co-host on the West Coast, Mitch Simon. And we invite you to join us to Team Anywhere. Safety? Empathy? Comedy? Yes, we've heard that to build engaged and thriving dispersed teams, we must have leaders that create psychological safety, demonstrate empathy, and yes, have a sense of humor. But how do you do it? On today's podcast, returning guest and author of The Human Edge, Greg Orme, shares with us how it's done so that you can build highly engaged teams anywhere. Welcome to another episode of Team Anywhere. I'm your co-host, Ginny Bianco Mathis on the East Coast, and I am here with my wonderful and talented co-host, Mitch Simon, on the West Coast. And today we are excited to have a return guest, <clears throat> Greg Orme, who is with us to continue his story and his journey of his fabulous book, The Human Edge, which most of you know now, had won the uh, best book, business book of the year for 2020. Welcome, Greg. Oh, well, it's great to be back. Uh, hello, guys. I'm delighted to be here. Good. Well, it's hard to pin you down. Every time I look on LinkedIn, you're going off somewhere to share your brilliance, and we appreciate you doing that for us today and with our audience. And a reminder that um, Greg is this incredible consultant in the world of the nexus of technology, the digital world, humanity, um, and teams and leadership. And he consults with dozens upon dozens of organizations. And as you can tell from his accent, he's coming with to us today yeah. from England. Yeah, that's right. All right. So to begin, just to open up a little, um, where what kind of ride has it been um, in terms of your book? Well, it's it's been pretty amazing. You know, Ginny, I was trying to remember how long ago it was. I was on the show. I think it was maybe last uh, summer or something. So so it's been you know maybe a year which has been obviously a weird year for everyone, but it's been a bit embarrassing how <laughs> successful the, the whole pandemic period has been uh, just because having content, obviously when everybody's going virtual and online is, is a pretty good place to be. And particularly uh, with the human edge, I found I wrote it answering the question, what do we need to be in a workplace that's, uh, full of machines and digital technology? How do we need to accentuate and protect our own humanity and differentiate ourselves from machines? But the four Cs, that model we talked about last time of uh, consciousness, curiosity, creativity, and collaboration is equally important when you're responding to a world of disrupted change, which of course we were in before, but um, has been accelerated, I think, arguably by by the pandemic. So it's been a good year. The book, since we spoke, has been translated into Korean and, and Chinese. Um, uh, I've been invited around the world. And now, actually, physically, I can get around the world, but yes. mostly from this square of carpet I'm speaking to you from now. But now I actually go there. So, yeah, it's been good. Excellent, excellent. Uh, again, now you're, you're probably going through that decision we're all making where we have a choice. Do I want to get dressed up and put a suitcase together and get on a plane or do I want to do it from here? Right. So, well, I, I mean, I, I guess it depends on the distance. Uh, yeah, what I like is, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to speak to you guys unless we were doing this. So there are some things you just can't do. Um, uh, but th then I, I do also really love the energy of being in a room with people. So I'm going to, to Dublin a couple of weeks time and we'll be with a couple of hundred people. And there's just, you know, that sustains me for weeks afterwards, that, that, that energy. So the only problem is now I need elasticated trousers because I've put on about a, uh, a stone during uh, the lockdown. But, you know, that, that can be provided. So I bought some of those. OK, terrific. Well, let's get into some of the specifics that I know you have been elaborating on in a lot of your um, uh, 
other podcasts and writings in Forbes, this notion of psychological safety, which uh, you believe now is incredibly important and how it's both intertwined and separate from the DNI agenda. Um, what is it and what are some of the best examples you have seen as you've been working with organizations? Yeah, I think it's an important concept. I'd say it's it's probably one of the big ideas in, in our world of leadership and teams for, for, for probably the last 10 or 15 years, obviously pioneered by a number of people, but not least by Amy Edmondson in her amazing book, uh, Fearless. And I think it has been connected to the DNI agenda quite rightly, because of course, if you are creating a more diverse organization where more minorities are welcomed in, you need to make them feel, even though they're a minority, that they have the permission to step in and speak up, which is the you know the, is the definition of psychological safety. But uh, generally, in my work, we take it. Uh, we obviously include that, but much broader. So I'm finding myself doing a lot, lot of team formation work uh, now with with boards and and teams just below board level in large organisations, and it's the first step. Uh, and I think where it gets slightly misinterpreted is a lot of people think about it as a, a just a safe environment, but really it's not just that. Uh, obviously, safety is part of it, but it's very specifically the feeling that it's safe for me to take an interpersonal risk. And so that's psychological speak for it's okay for me to speak up, to challenge, to ask questions and kind of make myself vulnerable. Because of course, if you do that, you might be wrong. However, a psychologically safe environment is where people can do that and have creative conflict to actually disagree with each other, uh, to, to disagree agreeably. So you actually get somewhere. So you learn. And that is the magic of it, because that it is absolutely the foundational first step to any good team. Right, right. So let me throw you into a situation. I am head of a team um, high up in the organization. I've got some people sitting in the room. I've got um, it's, it's a hybrid environment. I've got others on Zoom um, and um, we're talking about issues. And it is truly a psychologically safe environment. What, what kind of, let's say we're talking about strategy for the next six months. What kind of things are being said or done that says, huh, looks like there's a good amount of psychological safety in this. Oh, okay. So how do you ch tell if it's there? Is that yeah. not what the, Yeah, right, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so if I'm sitting in that room, and actually this is really live, you know, I'm doing this <laughs> on a week-to-week -week basis now. So you can tell if it's a psychologically safe environment for, for a number of, in a number of ways, that when something's brought up that's substantive and, and, and actually interesting, like I believe we should take this product to market now, or uh, I think we should hire these people, or I think we should get rid of these people or outsource it you know, really uh, decisions that have got um, outcomes that could have risk to it. People lean in and actually disagree. They challenge and they challenge each other. And the, the other thing they do, as well as just disagreeing, they disagree and get to an outcome and act upon it. So um, there may be a disagreement they're not looking for consensus, though. So they say there's seven or eight people in your fictitious room. And we have one of these issues I just mentioned. And five people are on one side of the debate and two people vehemently disagree. In a psychologically safe room, they will go around and they get will get the, the, um, the benefit of the diversity of opinion in that room. But then they will commit to the answer. Because they know they've got to make a decision. And the two people who disagreed may disagree, but they will say, OK, I will commit to this because as a team, we, we talked about it and actually we're going to we agree now. And the problem is if you don't have it, just to turn that round, and you don't have that vehement debate where people are really putting it out on the table, is no one ever commits because actually they go, OK, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead with it perhaps. But they never really said their piece. 
So they, what they'll do often is then subtly undermine that decision as it goes forward. So it's just a poison that is never kind of fully eradicated. You never have that moment of, of creative disagreement. So that's what you're looking for. Right. Now, how do you get the leader and the team? So, so let's say someone comes up with this idea and uh, we need to move, uh, you know, increase our footprint in India. You know, I'm just making this up. And uh, I disagree. All right. But I'm not yeah. saying anything. And I'm on Zoom. What should someone do? And how do they know it's OK to do that? Well, if, if somebody's really just not commenting, generally speaking, the leader and the rest of the team, because people in teams get to know each other's opinions and each other pretty well, they'll know that silence is disagreement or anger or whatever it may be. The only way to do that is to say, uh, in your in this case, you, you cast yourself in that role, Ginny. Ginny, what are you thinking? Please tell us what you're thinking. Uh, and and really invite that person to speak um, and have it out that way. But the issue is you can't just say, right, we're going to be psychologically safe now. That's my point. That's my it's point. Not, right. You can't flick the switch that way. Um, if you haven't done the groundwork first to get there, me saying, if I'm the leader and saying, Ginny, will you please tell us what you think? It's just going to provoke a fairly political response from you that's not going to really mean much. So there is a groundwork to it. It just doesn't just happen. And one of the jobs that I do is go in and talk to leaders and say, How, what can we do together with this team to encourage the vulnerability required to get to that psychological there safety in the first place? And, and, and so give me an example of what one leader um that you have seen do it well. And it, it could be a real simple one. Well, the, uh, you know, a lot of these things are pretty simple. Uh, I don't know if you've um, read the Lencioni book, uh, Five Dysfunctions of the Team. Great book, right? And it, effectively, he doesn't, re he doesn't talk about psychological safety much, but he, he does talk about trust being the foundation, conflict being the next level, if you remember, which leads to commit, which leads to accountability, which leads to results. That's, that's his triangle. So, and he talks about it being pretty simple. And that's my experience, too. So one of the first things I ever do with the team is uh, I talk to the leader first, ideally, and, and kind of gauge what, how, what their appetite is for this kind of work. But one of the key things is for them to show vulnerability first uh, by sharing something about themselves, ideally something maybe that didn't go so well in their past or in their life. Obviously, there's a risk here because what you're asking someone to be is an authentic human being in front of their team. Exactly. Uh, which isn't the norm in a lot of corporate environments. And, the, and the, there's, there's a, a real risk because if they fake it, it's worse than not doing it at all. It, you know, it because it, everybody can smell it and it's really, really terrible. But, you know, one, one of the first things that I, I do is that with, you know, obviously the leader going first is the key. But then just going around the room, uh, there's various ways you can get into it. I use um, a technique called lifelines you've probably heard of, which you literally plot your life, the ups and the downs. Yes. You've effectively broadened people's frame of reference to what is allowable in the environment. And then you encourage them to tell a story about, you know, what they were like at school. Yeah, their worst job, their best job, their most toxic boss, their favorite sibling, why they don't get on with their mum and dad. The things that we would talk about, maybe Gin, Ginny and Mitch, if we, you know, we were in the pub together. And, and just by doing that, it's absolutely shown that if you see someone's genuine human face, you start to view them as a, a genuine human being rather than a two-dimensional cipher. And that leads to this kind of psychological safety, this, uh, this ability to feel I can take a risk with you. That's the key to it. Uh, and so that's, as we say, incredibly simple, but in practice, quite hard to do. Totally, totally. I just love it. And, and then um, having the leader role model it, creating the groundwork for, oh, we're going to have that. We're going to the pub. <laughs> right? yeah. And now yeah. everyone could put that on and, and really start having some genuine, authentic conversations. I love that. 
I think some of the same things you could be saying about empathy, which is another area that you have spoken about. Um, what does empathy look like when a leader is showing empathy with the same team? What is he or she doing? Well, you know, this is another one of those concepts that comes across as being really fluffy and a little bit kind of new age and, um, you know, uh, kind of maybe weak. But I, I think I, I think it's so important now and it does kind of fit with psychological safety because the behaviors of empathy are things that will encourage psychological safety in others. And I just think, you know, if you're observing a leader who's being empathetic, they're probably not speaking. They're probably listening and observing. So that's one way you can see that they're not constantly on broadcast. Because to be empathetic is, you know, literally to walk in the emotional shoes of another person. To do that, you need to be listening to them. But, but you, you raise Brenny Brown, who I think is brilliant too. And she, she, she has this wonderful um, image of what an empathetic person is. And she talks about uh, a sympathetic person is someone who comes, walks along in the desert, looks down a hole and someone's right in the bottom of the hole. And they say, oh, it looks really terrible down there. Um, can I get you a sandwich, right? <laughs> Something like that. That's a sympathetic person. An empathetic person comes across the hole, sees you down in the cave and climbs down and really looks you in the eye and say, I know what it's like to be down here. Now, you know, I understand you. Let me help you. And that's the kind of difference in behaviors for an empathetic leader. And I think one of the reasons I found myself writing about it a little bit more recently in a post-pandemic era is for two reasons. One, I think hybrid as we as you guys know and talk about each week on this, is not going anywhere. It's here to stay. Uh, and two, in a more diverse world, the ability to walk in another person's shoes, if they're not my race or my gender or my sexuality or my experience or my nationality, is even more difficult for me. It's more of a reach. So I have to build up my empathy muscles yeah. to do that. I also have to build up my empathy muscles to look through a screen and see Mitch uh, all those many thousand miles away and try and read what's going on with him, right? So I just have to be a bit better at it. Uh, and what one of the things, just one final thought on empathy uh, is, I think, like curiosity, which we talked about last time, I think the cool thing about it is it's not a fixed trait like having blue eyes or something. You can consciously build it in yourself. You know, I, I'm a you know classic sort of male. I don't think in my early teens and early 20s, I was a particularly empathetic person. I think having kids and experience of life and a few, quite a few failures has helped me understand other people. Uh, but then I've sort of consciously worked on it. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, it's shown that that, that that can work. So that's one of the things I, I work with leaders on. How do, you, how do you actually, what do you do to become more empathetic? I love that. And um, I, was, I was also working with a team and they wanted to show more empathy. And they, they, they made a commitment to encourage one another and support one another in demonstrating that. And so a phrase that kept coming up was, that was good. Can you be even more empathetic? <laughs> So, so they all have to keep reaching, as you said. It, it's a, it's a spectrum, and you can get yeah. good, and you can get better. What are, uh, so, Greg, what are you what are you encouraging uh, team members on hybrid teams and dispersed teams to do to raise the empathy level? It's a really good question. I think again, you know, the response to this it sounds ridiculously simple, but. To build empathy, one of the one of the proven ways to do it, and one of the exercises I give to leaders, is literally to uh, to try to to try and put time time aside to have one conversation a day in which they're not trying to solve a problem for the person. Uh, they're literally nice. like fifteen minutes uh, on a you know even in a hybrid and virtual world, they're they're on a Zoom call or whatever whatever the, the platform is. And they're literally just curious about that person. So they're just asking questions and responding to what they hear, which sounds so like ridiculously simple, but it's not the normal way of being at work. Um, so just uh, th that's one way. There are other slightly more bizarre ways, um, you know, there's, which I've not actually done in my coaching, but I'll, I keep thinking I should, which is apparently if you read more fiction books, um, 
you become more empathetic. <laughs> now, I, know, I know you guys are into practical tips, but I thought I'd throw that one in because I think it's really cool because the, the reason is if you really get into a book or a movie, you are empathizing. That's why we're hooked on them oh, because we're yeah. literally walking to, into the main character's emotional shoes and you kind of get used to it. So that, that's maybe another thing for the future. <laughs> I love that. I mean, you can show someone a clip, right? And, and, Oh, I, 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 I might use that. I love that. Uh, little, but, but, you yeah. know, one of the things about empathy, there's a famous psychological study of the, you know, the guys, um, uh, it's called the uh, Good Samaritan study, where there's a guy going to another room and then someone's collapsed in the corridor. It was actually done in a Catholic seminary, weirdly enough. So, so it was very appropriate. And the people just stepped over this person who was clearly like having a heart attack. Uh, and, and, and you know, obviously, uh, I'm sort of cutting to the chase here because this was a really it's very famous experiment. These these literally these Catholic priests who were actually, I think, going, I think they made it even more ironic because they were on, on the way to a lecture about the Good Samaritan. <laughs> so they stepped over this person. And the reason is because they obviously had control studies and they had one with this and one with the other. The people that were under time pressure were the ones who stepped over because you kind of assume so I'm in a hurry someone else will get this person behind me someone else will look after this person so I think the time pressure we put out on ourselves in business and the relentless pace is one of the reason people are not empathetic so that's something that leaders need to attend to to find a little bit of slack time in to talk to people and for people to talk to each other and to be observant oh I love that and I do that exercise in some uh, workshops where I pair people up and I say, you're the person with a problem. So just start sharing your problem. And you're going to be the person who is going to try to help them. But all you can do is ask questions. Yeah. Nothing else. They go insane. <laughs> right? They want to tell the person what to do. They... They, you know, just the being forced to listen and ask questions. So I'm so glad you brought that up. It's very powerful. Now I want to go and, and add just another layer to all this, because obviously they intertwine. You recently wrote an article in Forbes on humor and how important humor is these days with virtual and hybrid. Could you talk a little more about that? Yeah, I, I just think, uh, it, you know, it's kind of connected I think whatever, you know, we've had this post pandemic and it seems to have framed our world entirely. But, you know, I think this was true beforehand as well, that humor is so underused in business um, because one of the things I'm interested in is leadership communication as well as as, as teamwork and, and, and other parts of it. And in I've found and I've looked at the studies on this uh, and it's just my experience, a leader that uses humor uh, well in the right way just cuts through. You know, when we are, we, you know, we, we, we're human beings now that are facing a, a tsunami of information every day. We're just overwhelmed by all this noise. So if you can find a way to cut through the noise and get people to remember what you're saying, engage with you and connect, I'm all for that. And I think humor is a really underused tool for that. And the other things that I mean, humor has got all sorts of outcomes not just that it's a powerful tool for leaders. All the studies show people who have bosses who every now and then bring a bit of fun in, um, crack a joke, whatever it may be, they consider them to be twice as effective as bosses who are kind of po-faced and straight-faced about it. But there's, there's also outcomes in terms of resilience, creativity, collaboration, all the things that we're talking about. So it's, it's incredibly powerful. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you give me an example of someone you've witnessed that uses humor well Absolutely. In, in, in the business setting? Yeah, I, you know, one of my first, um, I was actually, I was the CEO of a joint venture between London Business School and University of Arts London. And I had a, had a chairman, um, a guy called Vanny Treves, who came in and I was pretty green at the time. And he part of his job was sort of raising uh, attention for this little thing I was running. And I just noticed whenever he stood up, he, he, what, one, he spoke very much in the moment, 
whereas it wasn't you know he was actually re- really so he was responding to the audience just like a proper stand up does you know if if you're in a listening to a stand up comedian and someone drops a tray in the back yeah they don't ignore it do they they, right. they they lean into that moment always because that's that's funny people want you to be in the moment and i just noticed that he had people in the palm of his hand and it always started with a joke it was always pretty self deprecating it was always funny and I, I've noticed I've ever since then I've I've tried to study people who are good leadership communicators. They're nearly always people who have the courage to be a bit self-deprecating, bring in humor, see the absurdity of life as yes. well as the seriousness of business. And then then I was always been interested in it. And then all the research on it is absolutely uh, very compelling. So yeah, I we, we you know uh, that. Most of the people who I consider to be really, really powerful leaders in the in the organisations I work with realise this. They may not have studied it because that's a bit weird, isn't it? But you know, and it's not like they're stand up comedians. People are as funny as you are, right? It's not. It's not about that. It's just sort of bringing more of yourself to work, more of the true, whole human being, rather than this this mask that we were talking about at the start. Right. It's another way to be vulnerable. It's another way to establish the trust. All these yeah. things uh, tie together. Yeah. And it's it's very also very close to storytelling, because if you watch a comedian, which I do a lot, they go from one story to another story to another story. And they're so impactful. Absolutely. Um, so I like I like Greg, the that you said, um, you know, because the obvious question is how to be more funny. And that's not a funny question. Um, is, is to be more funny is to just be more real. Um, and you know, because humans are funny, you know? And so if you, if you bring a a story of how something went well or how something didn't go well, that's funny. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I work with a comedy writer who that happened to be a school friend of mine, uh, during the pandemic. And we, we did a few kind of podcasts and stuff and we did one on humor and Tim uh, wrote a really good TV, uh, comedy series here in the UK. And he said, uh, well, what's a joke? It's an unexpected truth. Mm. And, and, and I think what he meant by that was it's pointing and being truthful about, about life. And let's face it, so much of leadership is about slightly, you know, bad leadership is about blurring the facts, not being straight, not being clear. As soon as someone actually points to it and maybe breaks a taboo or bricks some, brings something up they shouldn't, which is, you know, effectively what a joke is, um, you know, it cuts through. People see that there's truth in it. And that's why the, the great, you talked about standards. The great standards are just telling us stuff we know. Yeah. And, and it's the recognition that we know it. But they have just put it, they've put it in a really interesting way that draws us to them. And, um, and, and if listeners are saying, yes, I know what you mean, but I can never do that. Yeah, you can. I think it's a, it's a, a muscle. Yeah, there's some naturals. A, a lot of folks that go into stand-up comedy, right, are natural. But, but it's what Mitch says. It's, it's, not, it's not setting out to say you know because suddenly you're in the land of the office you know i know there's the us office and the uk office that you know that's really excruciatingly embarrassing when someone wants to be i mean the intention is to be a comedian not you know that's just awful but it's not that it's it's really bringing things that you might not normally see into the office and i'm not talking about items like a <laughs> Like a kind of funny glasses. I'm talking about parts of yourself, you know. Because I like the big nose. Myself. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I, I, and, you know, I say to, you know, because we often have people say, well, isn't that really dangerous? Certainly in a world of diversity and inclusion where, you know, you don't want to be t- cracking the wrong joke, etc. Of course, you know, it's not really about punching down. Uh, there's a funny article that says, don't punch down, punch yourself. Yes. Uh, so so you can start with yourself a little bit and, and work from there because the the more people are at the hierarchy, somehow the funnier the if they say anything that's even remotely funny, people laugh because mm-hmm. they just don't expect it. Wonderful point. Oh my gosh. I think that ties in so well all, all of the major topics around being uh empathetic, being authentic, um, adding the humor. It's showing um, a piece of yourself that now is creating more trust uh, with 
our teams, no matter where they are, and turning out to be stronger leaders. Thank you so much for that. How can our listeners find you, buy your book, listen to more of you? Oh, well, you're asking my kind of questions now, Ginny. Uh, so uh, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. I'm at Greg Orm on LinkedIn, so you can find me there. I think I'm at Gregory Orm. <laughs> it sounds like my mum's calling me at the back uh, on, on Twitter. I'm also on Instagram now um, at Greg Orm, I think. And if they want to just go straight to my website, it's Greg org. So uh, be do- what I do actually each month now, which I started during the pandemic, is I put out a monthly, I guess you'd call it a newsletter called The Curious Human. And it's all the things I found that month in my explorations to try and write my forwards articles. So, you know, yes. great videos and podcasts and other things. So uh, they can go and connect on my website and, and they'll get that into their inbox. Fabulous. Well, I want to thank you so much. Uh, Mitch, can you tie this all together for us? Yeah, just um, for our listeners in the US, we just, um, this is the one thing that's on your mind is how much actually is a stone? It's about 14 pounds. So, Greg, losing 14 pounds, that's amazing. Um, so, I just had to get that. I gained stuff. it, Mitch. That was the problem. <laughs> you, gained it. you gained it. Well, you'll lose it. Uh, and then, uh, if you want to see Mitch Simon doing stand-up comedy, that's actually available on YouTube. So you have to send oh, this little email because I actually did that. Um, if you want to see Mitch Simon doing live comedy, oh, I'll look out for that. San Diego. But anyways, that's another part of my life. So anyways, uh, this has been fantastic, Greg. Thank you so much. Uh, please, um, to our listeners, um, go out, share this uh, podcast with your friends, with your colleagues, with your German Shepherd. And uh, Ginny, it's been a, a blast. We'll look forward to seeing you all next time on our next episode of Team Anywhere.